Let's turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 20. We're continuing our study of uh, basically history of Israel, really seen through the life of David. We started back in 1 Samuel. We saw Samuel and we saw Saul, the first king, looking at David, the second king. We'll actually go to the first 11 chapters of uh, 1 Kings and we'll look at the life of Solomon and then we're going to do some other things. But we're really looking at King David and when we see David, we think of a man after God's own heart. Uh, incredible man. And yet we see that because of his sin with Bathsheba, there are consequences. And the prophet came to David and basically said, the soul will not depart from your house. There's going to be issues and problems and conflicts. And we saw that with his sons and all kind of problems. And David has just, we've just seen that David has just stopped a rebellion. His son Absalom tried to take over the kingdom, tried to take over. David had to flee, went across the Jordan River, went to the other side. Absalom came after him. Absalom was killed in the battle. And, and it looks like things are going to be okay. And they've come back to Together. David's trying to reconcile and, and bring everybody back together. And we saw there was division already between the north and the south, between the ten tribes and the two tribes. And so all these things are happening. Well, this morning, something else. There's another rebellion. And a guy by the name of Sheba comes, and he's called a worthless fellow. We'll talk about what that means in just a minute. And so we're going to see that. And as we look at this, we'll see two things. One, we're going to look at Joab. Now, we know who Joab is. David had a sister who had three, brother, uh, had three sons, Joab, uh, uh, Abishai and Ashel, and Joab has been David's general. We said that Joab is a mighty warrior, but we also said that Joab, you got to be careful. You want to be on Joab's side because sometimes Joab does some really good things and sometimes Joab does some really bad things. And we're going to watch his character today and see what he does, and we'll, we'll see some things about him. And then we also are looking at unity, that, and that's the issue. David's trying to do everything he can to unify the people after this rebellion, and we're going to see now this other rebellion. So we'll see what happens. Now, as we start, I'm going to bring up something that we've talked about a lot of times, uh, that when people start looking for jobs or when people graduate from college or when people try to look for different things, what do people look for? And I've saw some studies. We've, uh, we've been seeing this over a long time, and the studies always say the same things. What do people look for when they uh, want to hire people? And some people say they're looking for skills or intelligence or honesty or organizational skills. Well, it comes down, and this is the, this is the two things every time when people look for hiring. And the first two things are honesty, integrity, which means character. They're people of character, and they're faithful. Their faithfulness, dependability. And so when they look for people, for what, what do you look for? They're saying people of character. And the truth is, that's what we want to be. We want to be men and women of character who are honest and loyal and faithful. And, and w when we do our jobs or when we even serve our Lord, we want to do that. And so we could even ask a question, how do we measure up? Well, the reason I bring this up is we're going to look at Joab. What kind of man is Joab? Now, we know he's a great warrior. We know he's a great fighter. We know he's David's nephew, and, 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 and yet uh, there's been all kind of problems with him. He's killed some people he shouldn't have killed, and so we're going to see what happens this morning. Let me give you sort of the outline of the passage of what we're going to look at this morning. Let me show you this. We're going to see Sheba's rebellion, and we're going to see David has a plan with a mesa, and then what Joab does, and then we're going to see they attack the city, and we see a wise woman. And then we see at the end, David's government. So let's see what happens. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 20. And just remember that. Let me just give you a little background. Remember, Absalom tried to take over the kingdom. David had to flee the, the city and went across the Jordan River and up in the other part. And, and then Absalom finally came after him. And then there was a war. And David's mighty men, who are incredible, they are great fighters. They had naturally defeated uh, uh, Absalom, and Absalom was killed, and everybody kind of ran, and now David has come back, and as he's coming back, he's been crossing over the Jordan River. In fact, last couple of weeks that we studied these passages, David was at the Jordan River, and different people came to him and all of that. And so now as he's about to come back, another rebellion. And so look at chapter 20, uh, 2 Samuel 20, beginning at verse 1. Now, a worthless fellow happened to be there, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, Benjamite. He blew the trumpet and said, we have no portion in David, nor do you have an inheritance of the son of Jesse. That's another way to say David's name. Every man to his tents, O Israel. Now, here's this man, and suddenly he, he's going to have a rebellion. We, we're, we're going to see a second rebellion against David. And this man, he's called a worthless fellow. Really, it, the word is a son of Belial. And it has an idea of, of being almost like an unbeliever or someone who rebels against God. So this idea of being a worthless fellow has the idea of one who rebels against God. And so he's going contrary to the Scripture because he's rebelling against David. David is God's anointed king. And we've got to remember that God, the anointed king of Israel was very special. 
Even when Saul was the king and Saul was not a very good king, David would never touch Saul because he'd said, I cannot touch the Lord's anointed. Now here's David as the king and there's all kind of rebellions. And so here's this man named Sheba and it says he was from the tribe of Benjamin and he says, we have no portion with David. And, and so everybody their tents. And so verse two says, all the men of Israel withdrew from following David. And you go, what? The men of Israel, that's the northern part. And they followed Sheba, the son of Bichri, but the men of Judah remained steadfast to their king from the Jordan, even Jerusalem. So we see a division again. Now, we talked about it last week, that the division between what we say the northern part and the southern part is starting now. It's going to go through the life of David. It's going to go through the life of Solomon. And then when Solomon dies, it's going to be a split, and there's going to be two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so here's this rebellion. And when you, when you think about these people saying, we don't want to have a part with David, and this man says, we don't want to have a part with David, Remember, we see conflict, and sometimes we see the same thing. There, sometimes in our Christians, in the body of Christ, there's this attitude that we do our own thing. We want to do what we want to do. We don't have to have a part with the local body. And we know that God has ordained the local body, that we all to use the gifts, talents, and abilities that God's given us, and we come together to serve in that way. And there's no such thing as the Lone Ranger Christian where you just do your own thing. And so we, we want to see that. And we see, here's this man. He's saying, I'm not following David. And so we're going to see what happens. David it seems to have lost some respect of some of the people. And, you know, we love David. When I study the Bible, I look at this and I think of David. And I think, man, one day I'll get to see him and I'll say, wow, David, you were amazing. He was a man after God's own heart. Even when he failed, he's a man after God's own heart. And what, God, what that shows us is that God takes people. And even when we fail, he'll still take us and use us for his glory. He can take us wherever we are. I've had some people say things like, well, you don't know all the things I've done. Well, you don't know all the things I've done. And let me just say this. God will take you where you are. And when you, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. He will take you and use you as long as he's got you on this earth. So here we see this worthless guy telling everybody, let's divide. And, 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 and I, I think when you start thinking about division and disunity, probably one of the issues there is the selfishness. And there are a lot of, that's part of one of the main reasons, I think, for division and disunity. Anytime we start saying, this is what I want, and I don't really care what anybody else wants, there's going to be division. We know this, that the key for ministry within the body is within the local church is unity, and it goes to, to build one another up, to not so much seek the things for yourself. And that's why Philippians talks about that sort of thing, is, is it's not to look out for ourselves, but to look out for the others. And so we see that. Now, watch what David does. He's now come back. To the, to the kingdom and come back to Jerusalem and look what it says. Then David came to his house at Jerusalem and the king took the 10 women, the concubines, whom he had left to keep the house and placed them under guard and provided them with substance, but he did not go into them. So they were shut up until the day of, his, of their death, living as a widow. Now, remember what David did. David, when David left, running off, he left 10 women there in the kingdom and when Absalom came, and I hate to even say it publicly, but I mean, we read it, we had to say it. When Absalom came, he took those 10 women, put a tent up on top of a building, and went in and had sexual relations with those 10 women in front of everybody so that they would know that he, the Absalom, is claiming to, be God, claiming to be the king. Well, when David comes back, he takes the 10 women and sets them off by themselves, takes care of them, but he doesn't have anything to do with them anymore. In fact, that's why it says, it says they were shut up until the day of their death, living as widows. And that's what David did. He said, basically, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of those women, but I won't have anything to do with them because of what Absalom did. Well, now, what are we going to do about this guy? What are we going to do about this guy, Sheba, who's, who's in rebellion? And so what does David do? Then David said to Amasa, verse 4, Call out the men of Judah for me within three days and present uh, pres and be pre present here yourself. That's what he says. He calls Amasa. Now, remember, Amasa was the general in Absalom. Now, let me just say this. We thought this was the weirdest thing. Here, David is fighting for his life. And Absalom has a guy by the name of Amasa to be his general. David defeats them all, kills them and everything. And now Amasa's left. And David comes in and makes Amasa his general instead of Joab. And when we read that and we looked at that, we said, David, Joab's not going to like that a lot. We know what Joab is like. And we know, why would you do that? And we said that he did it for two reasons. One was to probably try to bring unity since Amasa had been with the other group. He says, I'm going to bring them together. But I think it's also to punish Joab. Remember, Joab is the one that killed David's son. After David said, be careful with my boy, be careful with Absalom, Joab killed him. 
And I think David knew that. And David said, okay, you're not going to be the, you're not gonna get to be the general anymore. Now, we all know how Absalom's going to deal with this. I mean, how Joab is going to deal with this. Joab does what Joab wants to do. Joab has always been a leader. Joab has always been a warrior. Joab has always been David's right-hand man. And now David has said, you can't be it. And Amasa's going to be it. Well, he tells Amasa, get everybody together, get the army together within three days, and we'll go after this guy. Verse 5. So Amasa went to call out the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which he had appointed him. Wait a minute, what happened? David says, well, you know, three days, get back here, get the army together, and let's go. And three days pass, four days pass, more days pass. What's going on? What, what, where is Amasa, and what has he done? Well, you could look at it this way. What's the problem? Why is the delay? First of all, maybe, and it's probably true, the men didn't trust Amasa. Amasa was the general on the other side. Second is, maybe he just didn't do it. He just wasted his time. But I think the real reason is, Amasa is not a leader. Amasa is not a great general. Amasa is not going to be a great warrior and fighter. And the people don't rally around him. And so when he went to round people up, nobody would come. And so uh, the, the truth is that he's not very faithful. And we want to be faithful. We want to be faithful in, in not only in our jobs, but we want to be faithful in serving the living God. So what's David going to do? I mean, the guy that he says, you're now my general, get everybody together, and nobody comes together. So you know David. David is a man of action. He doesn't just sit around. So what does he do? Verse 6, Then David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him so that he does not find for himself fortified cities and escape from our sight. So what David does, he calls what we'd call the loyal man Abishai. If you remember, I mentioned it a while ago, David had a sister who had three sons, Joab, Abishai, and Ashiel. Ashiel got killed in a battle early. So these two sons, these two boys are there. Of course, they're older. They're men, Abishai and Joab. Joab has been the general. Abishai has always been a great loyal fighter for David, always. Now, Joab has been a great loyal fighter for David, but you can't always trust Joab. You just don't know what he's going to do. So David does not call Joab. He calls Abishai. And he says, Abishai, you got to get the people together and go fight. Go catch that guy. Because if he ever gets to some of those cities, we may never be able to get him. So look at verse 6 again. David said to Abishai, now she with the son of Bichri will do us more harm than Absalom. Well, look, he's going to cause us more trouble than the Absalom did. So take your servants, that's the soldiers, pursue him so that he's not find for himself fortified cities and escape. He said, we got to go get him, and they got to go get him right now. But look at the next verse. So Joab's men went out after him along with the Cherethites and the Pelethites, all the mighty men, and they went out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. So Joab's going. Joab's going. Look, Joab's going, and he's got a plan. We'll talk about it in just a minute. So instead of it just being Abishai going out and leading the group, Joab's going with him too. Now, David never told Joab to go. But, you know, Joab is a warrior and a fighter, He's not going to be left behind on anything. And he says, I'm ready to go, and I'm going. And now, uh, if you notice, uh, he names the Cherethites or the Pelethites. That was different groups of people. But it says also the mighty men. You remember, David had a group of men that joined with him when he was running from Saul. Some of those men were called the mighty men. We're going to find later there's a listing of 37 mighty men. We're going to talk about that right at the end of the passage this morning. But, but uh, the, the mighty men, they were great warriors. And that's why when Absalom brought his people to fight David, David's mighty men just whipped the dog. I mean, just defeated them because they're great warriors. Joab has a plan. Look what happens. So verse 8, when they, when they were at the large stone, which is Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now, Joab was dressed in his military attire, and over it was a belt with a sword in it. She fastened at his waist, and he went forward, and it fell out. Now, let's stop for a second. What, what are we saying? That when they got up to the stone area at Gibeah, here comes a Mesa. Now, Mesa's supposed to have gotten the army together, but he hadn't. He's coming, and Joab know, probably knew he was coming, and some of the men are there. And it says Joab is dressed in his warrior attire. Now, he's got a belt around, and he's got a sword down in it. And that's what they did. They carried it around. And if they need to, they pull that sword out and fight and put it back in his sheath. But notice what this says. And it, you might say it's a little strange. It says that he had a belt, but 
as he went forward, it fell out. Now, do you think Joab's sword is going to fall out on its own? No. I think Joab on purpose leaned over. His fall, sword fell out. So Joab picked it up like this. Now, remember, Amasa's coming toward him. They're together. Amasa sees it fall out. So he doesn't think anything about it. He, said, he could have said, hey, you dropped your sword. No, you know, so he dropped his sword. And suddenly, Joab has that sword in his hand, not in his sheath. And watch what happened. Joab said to Amasa, is it well with you, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Remember, they come to meet. Joab has the sword. They're going to reach up, and they're going to reach up and kiss each other as brothers. But Joab has the sword in his hand. Notice, but Amasa, verse 10, was not on guard against the sword, which was in Joab's hand. So he struck him in the belly with it and poured out his inward parts on the ground and did not strike him again, and he died. Then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Wow. What does Joab do? He kills him. He kills him. The sword struck him in the belly. You can see Joab coming up and leaning over and the sword falling out. He had it fixed where it'd fall out. And here comes Amasa. He says, oh, I got to drop my sword. Hey, brother. And he killed him right there. Split him open. His insides fell out. Laid him on the ground. And then they left. We're going to see more. There's more to it than that. But that's what he did. It says the two brothers went after Sheba. Here's the question. What kind of man is Joab? This is not the first time we've killed some people. That he, was, he killed a guy named Abner. You remember Abner? Abner was a good guy. And he got Abner and said, Hey, Abner, come here. i got to talk to you. And as he walked out there, he stabbed him and killed him. Now, he's killed Amasa. What did Amasa do? Nothing. That was part of his problem. He didn't do anything, but he didn't do anything wrong. I want to remind you that toward the end of this book, we'll see a listing of the 37 mighty men. We'll see their names. Benai is one. We're going to see him later. Abishai is one. That's David's nephew. Ashiel, that's one. That's David's nephew. Uriah is listed as a mighty man. You remember Uriah? Uriah the Hittite. Uriah, who was the husband of Bathsheba. But guess who's not listed in the 37 mighty men? Joab's not listed. You could look at it and say, well, Joab is, was the general. Joab was one of the greatest fighters of all time. He was, but he's not a mighty man because he's not a man of character. See, the men that are listed as mighty men were not only great foyer, fighters and warriors, they were great Men. Joab was a man of skill, but not integrity. Are we people of integrity? What do we like? We live in a world that the culture is just going to pot. We've already seen that. We've been in the end times since Jesus Christ, but we're now the end of the end times. And if you read 1 Timothy 3 and 2 Timothy and also 1 Peter, you see that in the latter days it's going to be certain ways and we know exactly that's what we're seeing. What we have to do is be men and women of integrity in a fallen culture. We've got to stand up and be men and women who live by the Scripture, who do what's right. We've got to be people of honesty and loyalty and faithfulness. We've got to be godly men and women. The bottom line, we want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, which is Romans 8, 29. We must be people who live our lives based on God's word, in God's power. There has to be the standard, and it's the word of God. So how do you do your job? How are we with our family? How are we in our church? Are we men and women of integrity, faithfulness, honesty, godly men and women? That's what we want to be. Joab is a powerful man, but he's not a man of integrity. He killed, this is the second person he's killed, just, just like that. So it said, now look what happened when they left. But there stood by him one of Joab's young men and said, whoever favors Joab and whoever's for David, let him follow Joab. So look who's taking over. It's not Abishai, it's Joab. Joab's taking over. He's leading the battle. But look at the next verse. But Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the highway, in the middle of the road. And the men saw it. 
uh, and, and the man saw it and removed all the people, and all the people stood still. He removed Amasa from the highway into the field, threw a garment over him when they saw that everyone who came by stood still. So you see what happened. When Joab killed him and he fell down, he just laid there, blood everywhere, everything everywhere, and people would come up and they'd go, oh, good gracious, alive. And so this one man said, we can't, you know. So he took the body and he drug him off of the road out into probably the brush and covered up his body so that people wouldn't come and just stand there and look at what happened. Wow. Now, they're going after Sheba. Verse 13, as soon as he removed, was moved from the highway, all the men passed on after Joab to pursue Sheba, the son of victory. So here they're going after him now. And he's had time to get away. And he's going fast. Because if, if Amasa would have got the people faster, they might could have caught him faster, but now they haven't. And he's gone a long way. Look where he is. It says, now he went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel, even to Beth Makkah, and all to the Barites. And they were gathered together, and they went after him. So now where is he? Well, whoops. Let me go back if I can get it on there. There. And the map is really hard to see, but let me just show you a few things. This is Jerusalem. This is where they have been. This is Samaria. This is the Sea of Galilee. They all the way up north past Dan to a city called Abel Beth Makkah. And look how far it is. It's up almost even with Tyre and, and Sidon up there. So it's a long way. He's run a long way. And so Joab and Abishai and the rest of the men, they're going after him. When we get there, look, it says in verse 15, and they besieged him, and they came and besieged him in Abel Beth Makkah, and they took up a siege ramp against the city, and it stood by the rampart, and all the people who were there with Joab were wreaking destruction in order to the top of the wall. Well, they came to this city, and by the way, we're going to see that this is sort of a little famous city in, the, in Israel, and they came, and they started putting up dirt and everything to siege ramp to go up over the wall. They're going to try to take the city, tear down the wall. It says they're doing all this, and think, think about the people in the city. They're going, what's going on? Why are we being attacked? What have we done? What have we done? And so they don't know exactly what's going on. But I want to stop for a second because we're going to see what we call a wise woman. And let's talk for just a minute about wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, wisdom is a key in life. And what is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of the truth. Now, you can have knowledge without wisdom. With knowledge and, and application equals wisdom. So what you have is you have truth, knowledge, and then you apply that in your life, and that's wisdom. And so there are a lot of people who know things, but they don't make applications. If you notice the book of Proverbs and the book of Psalms are deal with, we call those wisdom literature. Proverbs, there are 31 Proverbs. Let me tell you what you can do. Proverbs is wisdom literature. You can read the proverb of the day, like today. Today is the 14th day of the month. This morning, early this morning, I read Proverbs 14. Tomorrow, I'll read 15. If three, four, five days from now, and it's the 24th, I'll read Proverbs 24, whatever comes up. What happens is if you read it every day, then that means once a month you read the entire book of Proverbs and you read the wisdom literature. And it'll say something like, the wise man does this, but the foolish man does this. And you want to be wise. You want to say, I want to learn how to live wisely. It's knowing the truth and making application. Well, they're attacking. They're attacking the city. And look at verse 16. Then a wise woman called from the city, Here, here, please tell Joab, come here that I may speak with you. So this woman calls out to some people fighting and saying, Tell Joab to come here, I need to talk to him. I need to talk to him. So he approached her and the woman said, Are you Joab? And he said, I am. And then she said to him, Listen to the words of your maidservant. And he said, I'm listening. I mean, you can almost see this. Are you Joab? Yeah, yeah. Would well, you listen to what I got to say? Well, I'll listen. Tell me what you want to tell me. So what does she want to say? She spoke saying, formerly, they used to say they will surely ask advice at Abel, and thus they ended the dispute. She said, listen, we're the kind of city that have always had wise leadership. And when people had disputes, sometimes they would even come to our city and say, we got a problem, help us solve it, and we would help them solve it. We've always been a good city. And, and, and so we've always been a wise city. And then she said in verse 19, I am of those who are peaceful and faithful in Israel. You are seeking to destroy a city, even a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? She says this, well, we're peaceful. Why are you trying to destroy our city? Well, why are they trying to destroy the city? Who's in there? Sheba's in there. So watch what he says. Joab replied, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. 
Such is not the case. But a man from the hill country of Ephraim, Sheba the son of Bichri, by name has lifted up his hand against King David. Only hand him over and I'll depart from the city. So I'll stop right there for a second. He says, if you'll give me the guy, we'll leave you alone. We're not wanting to destroy your city. We just try to get to the guy. And right now, the only way we can get to the guy is to destroy the city. And the woman said to Joab, behold, his head will be thrown to you over the wall. <laughs> I mean, think about what she just said. She didn't say, okay, we'll tie him up and hand him to you. She said, we'll cut off his head and throw his head over the wall to you so you can see that it's him and that it's over with. And so we only want, see, he says, we only want him, Asa. And so she says, we'll throw his head over the wall. We'll kill him for you. You don't have to kill him. We'll kill him. And we'll stop all this. So the woman wisely came to the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he blew the trumpet, and they were dispersed from the city, each to his tent. Joab also returned to the king at Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot in that chapter, but I want you to think about it. They, can you imagine waiting outside the wall, and all of a sudden a head comes thrown over the wall, hits the ground, and somebody says, yeah, that's him. I mean, that's what happened, right? That's him. And uh, so that Joab said, that's it. We, uh, we got him. They blew the trumpet. Everybody goes back. Notice how this, hap this ends, this verse. It says, Joab also returned to the king at Jerusalem. Wow. Let me put this up. We don't have what happened when Joab returned to David about his killing of Amasa. We don't have anything. We don't have any record of it. We don't know what they did. We don't know if Joab came back and said, listen, the guy was miserable. He was pitiful. He was stopping everything. I just had to take care of it. We don't know what he said. We don't even know what happened. But I want you to notice the next verse. Now, Joab was over the whole army of Israel. Joab is now back being the general. Let me tell you what I think. I, I think that David probably said, I can't keep dealing with Joab. He's going to do what he wants to do anyway. I might as well let him be general because he's just going to cause problems if he's not the general. And I think what David said is, okay, you're the general. You can be the general. Notice it goes on and gives us some information about the people. It says, now Joab was over the whole army of Israel, and Benaiah was the son of Jehadiah, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. Now, we're not sure exactly who those people are, but let me show you this. Joab is now the general, but this guy named Benaiah, we're going to see him again. We're going to see him a lot. In fact, when we get toward the end of this book and then we get into 1 Kings, we're going to see this man. He is a great warrior and a great man. And... Uh, so this is, this is one of the great, you may say, you, you may not realize this, but he's one of the great men of the Bible. And you might say, well, I've never even heard of him. I know because he doesn't get a lot of publicity, you know. But this guy, you're going to look at him in these next weeks to come, especially when we get into 1 Samuel. and you, I mean, 1 uh, Kings, you're going to say, what an incredible man. He's a great leader and a fighter. Let me go ahead and read. He goes on and says, uh, Adoram was over the forced labor, and Jehoshaphat was, uh, this, was the recorder. The recorder didn't just mean the guy who wrote the records. He was an advisor as well, but wrote the records. Shiva was a scribe. He wrote things down. Zadok and Abathar were priests. And then Ira the Jerite was also a priest of David. This word has an idea of a, of a kind of an advisor, a person that would come and help David think through some things. This guy's named Ira. So this is where we stop that we, we're at this point, and then what's going to happen? What's going to happen to David now? Because it's been one thing after another. Well, we'll see next week what happens. Sheba leads the rebellion and gathers some around him. David tells Amasa to go get the army, but Amasa fails. David sends Abishai, but Joab goes and kills Amasa. And then Joab leads the attack. They attack the city. The wise woman says, what's going on? They say, we want that man. They cut off his head, throw it around, and that ends the rebellion. And then David have the listing of his leaders. Let me give you some applications. The first one is this. Let's be men and women of godly character. Let's do it. Let's be, let's be men and women of integrity. It's so easy to follow the pulls of the world. I mean, our culture, and we know it, it's just so warped. And in fact, what, what, if you just go back 50 to 60 years, what we believe was what, it, what was accepted as the key. Now what we believe is what's rejected as the key. 
And the basic truths of what we believe about human beings and rights and wrongs, they've all been warped and changed. Let's stand for what is right. Let's live by God's word in God's power. Let's know the word of God and apply the word in God's strength. That's the only way we're going to be able to live. The only way we're going to live is live in God's power. That's the only way to do it. Stand for what is right. Be people of character, honest and faithful. Second, let's be wise people. Wise people is, is we, wisdom comes from the word of God, taking the truths from God's word and living by them. So that's what we want to do. We want to be wise men and women. The third thing is let's seek to keep the unity of the body. And it's so easy to break the unity. It's so easy to be upset about something. It's so easy to be, and the bottom line, it goes back to that selfishness. It goes back to, this is what I want. This is when I want it. I want to do my thing. Well, when we look at the Bible, the Bible says, look, be at peace with others. Put others before you. Never return evil with evil. Always return evil with good. And we want to be men and women who seek the unity. And then last, let's, this is something I want you to just think about from this passage, that, that God's anointed is going to always succeed, and that's David. There have been rebellion after rebellion against David, but David stays the king. David's going to be the king as long as God wants him to be the king because David is God's anointed one. And I want you to think about Jesus. He is the ultimate, ultimate anointed one of God, and he will ultimately succeed. He's already died on the cross to pay for sin and rose again. See, the right hand is on the Father. One of these days he's going to come get us. One of these days he's going to come to the earth as the King of kings and Lord of lords and rule in righteousness and justice. Even his death and resurrection, he died and rose again, and he will rule forever. Nothing can stop our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ought to rejoice in that fact. We look at things and we say they're all just falling apart. And as, as Jan Markell says, they're not falling apart. They're just falling together. And it is true. Everything is coming together to when Jesus is going to come get us. And let me just tell you something. It could happen at any second. One of these days, Jesus is going to come in the clouds with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain to be caught up together with and to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we will always be with the Lord. That's the next event. It'll be followed by a tribulation time period. It'll be followed by the second coming. It'll be followed by a kingdom. It'll be followed by the eternal state. All of that's coming. What God's word says is always true and is always accurate. One of these days, it could be any second because there are no signs for the rapture. It could happen at any second. The, the, rapture, the word rapture comes from a Latin word, rapio, which means a snatching away. The Greek word is arpazo, which means to pull and pull out. And that's why he says, and the dead in Christ rise first, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together. It's the word harpazo, be snatched up off the face of this earth. That's going to happen, and it could happen at any second. So I hope and pray that every one of you in this room, that you have believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life. You understand he died for you, paid for sin and rose again. He offers to you a gift. The gift is eternal life, and it's simply by faith. It is not works. It's faith alone in Christ alone. I hope and pray everyone in this room has trusted Christ.